will uh, get things going. So let's talk about AMD, age-related macular degeneration. First of all, I should define the term, just particularly the term macula. The front of the eye, of course, is the cornea. There's the wide of the eye that goes all the way behind it. As you go into the eye, there's, you're in the anterior chamber filled with the aqueous humor. Then you encounter the iris, the blue, brown, gray of the eye. The hole in the middle is the pupil. Right behind that is the lens when it's cloudy. The lens is called the cataract. When, lens, when cataract surgery is done, the lens implant goes there. And that's about a third of the way into the eye. Then the back two-thirds of the eye, you're now in the posterior segment or posterior chamber. You're, that's the area that's bathed by the vitreous humor. But the walls, the ceiling, the floor, the back wall of that globe, that dome, are all lined by the retina. The retina is the sensory transducer of the eye. It's the part of the eye that captures images, partially processes them, and sends them up to the brain through the optic nerve. The optic nerve exits the eye from not exactly center of the eye, back of the eye, but just off center. So the retina is actually about 10 layers deep, and I'll show you some pictures of retina. So there's, it's like a miniature brain. It does information processing, and that partially processed information is then complete the processing in the brain after it's transmitted to the optic nerve. So if you imagine the globe and that central inside back area, that's referred to as the macula. That's simply the central retina. The side walls, the ceiling, the floor, that's the peripheral retina. The back wall, the inside back wall is the macula. The macula specializes in two ways. One is that it lines up anatomically. So when we're looking at each other, we're using our maculas to look at each other. Our peripheral retina are just designed to keep track of large images, large objects, and movement. But we focus on the macula, that lines up anatomically. And secondly, the rods and cones, the photoreceptors that capture those images, that start the processing, are more densely packed in the macula. So we make out with more detail. So age-related macular degeneration is a degenerative condition in people over the age of 55 and older that affects their central retina or macula. Some people refer to the disease as macular, but that's a confusion. That's just the where the tissue is. It's like referring to a broken, uh, a broken leg and calling it lead. No, it's the broken leg. So macular is not the disease, it's the location. It's the anatomic tissue. Age-related macular degeneration, AMD. There are two forms. Dry, which is the most common by far, and that's, that's uh, due to deposits of metabolic debris in the layers of the retina, the deepest layer. Those are little white spots in the retina called drusen, and I'm going to show you pictures of that. Those are made up of uh, uh, disposed metabolic debris. The macrophages are supposed to come in, these cells, to clean up that debris, but they're impaired for reasons we don't understand in people with macular degeneration. That leads to cracks in the floor of the retina, and underneath the retina, at the back of the eye, there's a very vascular layer called the poroid, full of blood vessels, and those blood vessels are trying to break through all the time. And when they do, where the cracks in the retina are, then that becomes wet macular degeneration, which is about 20, 10 to 20% of patients with macular degeneration. Everybody with dry macular, everybody with wet macular degeneration has some component of dry, but most people with dry never get wet macular degeneration. And so I'll show you some of this. So this is the inside back layer of the eye. Again, imagine that this giant room is the eye. The front of the eye, the outside world is out that way, pointing back there. And here are the side walls of the peripheral retina, and here are the central back walls of the retina. But now we take the laser beam from the outside world and scan through and look at all the layers of the retina in cross-section. And here you can see them here. So in this view, the vitreous is in red, and you'd be lying flat on your back with the nose up above the ceiling tile. Here's the retina, and underneath it is that very vascular area, the choroid. And here, this is just what the choroid provides, nutrition for the retina. And it also it disposes of the waste material and fluids come out through the retina into the, choro and the, into the choroid. But when that's impaired, you get depositions of debris here. And that's what that little white mound, yellow mound is, a drusen, uh, which is a German word for glands. But it's not a gland. It just looked like glands to a German ophthalmologist in the 1800s. So you can see that. But this here leads to some um, damage to the Brooks membrane, this, this membrane that separates the retina from the pore capillaris. And at some point, blood vessels will break through and, and cause leakage. And I'll show you that in a minute. Here's a picture of the retina. When we take pictures of color pictures, there's the macula, central retina. That's the edge of the optic nerve. On this scale, the retina, the peripheral retina, would be all the way up to that wall and this wall. 
up well into the ceiling, halfway through the room and back this way. It's a hugely magnified view. The optic nerve is about one and a half millimeters in diameter. And this is the zone of the macula right here. And here you can see optic nerve again, the blood vessels. This is the macula, but this macula is abnormal, full of those white spots, the drusen that I mentioned to you, full of metabolic debris, the metabolic debris of vision. And these little white spots can cause damage to the photoreceptors sometimes, but not always. Sometimes they live there benignly without causing any visual impairment. But when it does advance, here's these drusen again, and it can advance either the wet, you can see bleeding there, that's a hallmark of the wet macula generation, or sometimes those little spots of the little drusen can lead to degeneration in that little area, deterioration, and they can spread and become confluent, create a giant area of what's called geographic atrophy, and that's when you can lose vision from dry macula generation. Here's another example. Again, there's blood from the wet macula generation, and there's the geographic air atrophy, the dryness, the dry macula generation that leads to a lot of loss of tissue. So here's an example, again, of the wet macula generation, what is called choroidal neovascularization, which is nicknamed CNV. Um, you might see that some places. These blood vessels break through Brooks membrane and either stay underneath the retina or break through the, uh, the RP, the deepest layer of the retina, you can get leakage either underneath here or here, and it leads to damage to the retina. <coughs> so the biggest success story we have in retina for the last 15 years has been that there are drugs that have been developed that cause these wet, these blood vessels that cause wet macular generation to shrink up and stop leaking. And that's the, those are the drugs that we inject in the eye, and I'll discuss those in a moment. The other thing that happens is dry macular generation. Again, this drusen buildup, you can see the drusen here, and they cause impairment, and the photoreceptors that overlie it become damaged, and we get loss of photoreceptors. And over time, that loss, if it gets big enough, results in loss of vision. The biggest bad news we have about macular generation is that there is no treatment for dry macular generation yet. Even the vitamins that people with macular generation take, those vitamins, which are hugely important, the nutraceuticals, are designed to, to halt or to reduce the likelihood of conversion from dry to wet. They do not stop the progression of dry to worse dry. There's a lot of clinical trials conducted here as well, looking at ways to treat dry macular generation, but as yet we have nothing for it. Historically, dry was the mild type of disease, but as we've learned to control the wet part of disease better and better, dry over time becomes more prominent. Before people lost their sight from the wet macular generation, before they lost could lose their sight in the dry. Now we're controlling the dry, the wet macular generation so well that people are beginning to lose sight from the dry. It's now become a driving factor. But there's a lot of research into this field. So what are the risk factors for macular generation? Um, increasing age, by definition. Light pigmentation. This is a disease prim primarily of Caucasians. People of any race and any pigmentation can get it, but it has a heavy preponderance in Europe. And the further northern in Europe, north you go in Europe, the more likely there is to get it. Cardiovascular disease is a risk, hypertension, smoking. And again, it's not typically hereditary, but there are many, several genes have been identified that increase the risk, and a couple that may actually be so important that may highly predict the ability to get macular generation, but in general, it's an indirect hereditary. Longevity is, a, is a genetic, so the longer you live, the more likely you are to get it. Light pigmentation is hereditary. The more lightly pigmented you are, the more likely you are to get it. But the, none of these confer an actual specific risk. There's been work from the age-related eye disease study, and again, I hand this out to patients commonly, and that work, there's two huge studies that everybody here in this room paid for. Taxpayers paid for it. Money spent by the National Institute of Health, the National Eye Institute. Money well spent because it discovered we discovered that despite the fact that most of the people, most of us that designed the trial were pessimists, thought the vitamins were a bunch of hooey, but we, so the study was designed to prove that the vitamins did nothing, much the opposite happened. The study proved that vitamins actually helped dramatically, particularly the antioxidants and the cofactors that zinc, lutein, which is a, a drug, a carotenoid, but zinc beta, uh, um, and beta carotene. Uh, were, were found to be beneficial, but we tend to only recommend zinc at this point. Beta carotene wasn't that helpful. And lutein, which is a carotenoid and zeaxanthin, were shown in the second ARED study. They're the active ingredient in dark leafy green vegetables, was also shown to be quite beneficial. 
So zinc and, and, and lutein are typically taken as, as supplements. So if you have a diet rich in dark leafy green vegetables, you may not need to take lutein. Additionally, omega-3 fatty acids, commonly in fish, salmon is very rich in omega-3 fatty acids. In the first ARED study, the dietary intake survey showed that that reduced the risk of going from dry to wet. But then in the second ARED study, when they actually supplemented with omega-3s, that um, found no benefit from there. So we don't know what to do about that. The whole field of ingesting omega-3 supplements is a bit suspect. It was designed for, for even cardiologists are not sure how beneficial that is. So a diet rich though in, in, in substance, rich, uh, diet rich in omega-3s, such as having fish in your diet, well, two to three times a week is what's recommended, along with daily intake of vegetables. The hero in the story is vascular endothelial growth factor. It was developed by uh, Ferrara scientists at uh, Genentech, amongst others. It was initiated by Judah Folkman at Harvard, but a lot of research, but much of the credit goes to, to uh, Napoleon Ferrara, who is now left Genentech. He's a professor at UC San Diego. He's an Italian physician who came to the United States to do research and really came up with not only the discovery of this molecule, but drugs to treat it, Avastin and Lucentis. And those are the big three. Ranibizumab, known as Lucentis, the first officially approved for this. Bevacizumab, also by Genentech, um, that uh, was used for uh, systemic neovascularization, new blood vessels. The gap that kind of came and went, and a flibercept, ILEA, has, been, uh, has become, I think, the most popular of the drugs now. And all these work in the same mechanism they cause the growth, the, their vascular endothelial growth factor, the blood vessels in the retina, the lining of them, the endothelium, is very leaky. So they make those vessels leak less and hopefully shrink up, but they're better at leaking less than shrinking. And here's an example of some pictures. Here's an eye with a fluorescent angiogram. Here you can see the optic nerve of the blood vessels after a dye was injected in the vein. That's the initial area of leakage, and over time you wait and see a zone, big zone of leakage. That's dye that shows up as well if you inject into the arm, and you can see it filling up the blood vessels and anywhere that there's leakage. What we spend most of our time doing, though, is looking at cross-sectional images on the OCT, optical coherence tomogram. And uh, this you can see is zones of uh, leakage. This will go to the bottom. This is after there have been injections of a, of a drug, of Aspen. You can see that this is fairly normalized. There's still some bumpiness down deep, but you see no leakage. Here you can see that's a pocket of fluid, there's another pocket of fluid. These are all pockets of fluid, and Avastin was injected here, and it, and it went away. But if you wait long enough, it comes back again. So typically you give injections, you follow them on a regular basis, and, eat, and you just determine the interval that they need to have injections, and then patients get injections on a regular basis, either to keep this fluid from coming back, or to treat it when it does come back. And these are injections in the eye. The needle's in the eye for about two or three seconds, but it's still alarming, but the first time you give it, the patients then typically, there's times when I think, you don't need an injection, Mrs. Jones. She said, no, I really want it. They perceive a benefit from the injections. So it's not unusual. It sounds crazy to say that they're asking for it when I'm recommending not, but that's how much they see the benefit because it affects the center of your vision. They can tell when they're leaking. And again, you see this nice response. Here's where it's wet and elevated, and here where it dries out. And cross, this is, again, the back of the eye in cross -section. So again, this is some of the data. This is uh, an important trial. It was done, uh, again, with NIH money, looking at Lucentis and Avastin. But the idea is that you would start injecting here, and vision gets better over time. That's the goal, is to improve your vision. So these are four different dose groups. Those were given injections every four weeks of one drug, every four weeks of the other, and then as needed. And it was to show that that was two different ways to treat. Here's ILEA versus Lucentis. They are the two most prominent commercially approved drugs showing that they're not different from each other. This was actually the study that led to the approval by LEA, which is the most recent of those approved, and has become over time the most popular. But again, you start injecting on a monthly basis and you get vision improving, and then you hope to stabilize it, but you see part of the dirty little secret is it tends to deteriorate over time. You get initial benefit, but if you go out five, six, seven, ten years, you can find deterioration over time. This all started, by the way, the seminal year was summer of 2005. It was when we first heard about this, so we've been doing this now for 13 years or so. By the fall of 2005, it was rolled out of Aspen. Summer of 2006, Lucentis became available. It became very heavy users of drugs. So it's been 12 years or so of great success, but still with these drugs only. And again, part of what they do is they dry out the retina. So we can see the thickness I showed you. We measure how much fluid there is and how much, it, how much fluid goes away. And you can see that's the goal, is to dry out the retina. And that's what these pictures show. 
So what else is being developed? Uh, lots of other stuff. I'm going to highlight a couple things of the new generation of anti-VEGF drugs. Uh, Converset, Abisapar, and Bromocizumab. Those are the new ones coming out. Uh, Bisapar is a DARPIN. It's by Allergan. It's completed its phase three trials. This is what some of the data looks like from an earlier phase trial. They've not yet officially released their phase three data. Again, they've completed their two big pivotal trials, Cedar and Sequoia. They kind of had a top line data. The results were good, but there's some inflammation, so we're waiting to see. So that's exciting, but that's going to be an every 12 week injection. Basically, the new generation of anti VEGF drugs, they're still anti VEGF drugs, but what we're trying to do is increase the interval injection. So patients don't have to come in every four, six, or eight weeks. They can come in every 12 or 16 weeks. For now, we're trying, that's our primary goal, and then there'll be new pathways that we're exploring. Brolocizumab is the most developed of the new ones and probably the most exciting. It is going from the original Avastin as a full monoclonal antibody of VEGF. Then you get to, uh, well, Flipperset is a fusion protein, but Ranibizumab is a fragment of the monoclonal antibody, and Brolocizumab is a smaller fragment still, but very, very potent. And because it's so concentrated, we can give a much higher dose, and it seems to last quite a bit longer. We're very excited about this. It's been fully developed, but it's not yet commercially available. This is to show the vision improving in the Hawk and Harrier studies, the key studies that led to the approved, uh, not to the, or the pivotal studies. It's not yet been approved by the FDA, but we're excited about its possibility. Hopefully over the next year it will become available. Again, this shows the drying of it. The thick retina becomes thinner, the wet retina becomes thinner over time because of the injections. So we're excited about brolocizumab when it comes out. And that's the first one to come out over, uh, of the new generation. And finally, there's Converset, which is from China. We're not sure how much it's going to succeed there, there because the patents on it seem to be very similar to ILEA, but it's a drug that's been fully developed in China, and they're going to try to release it worldwide. Again, they've shown a bunch of clinical trials showing vision benefit. They're going to try to give this every quarter. Again, that's the goal. The new gold standard is it used to be every month. Now we're trying to get to every quarter. That's our goal is to get patients on a regular basis, only need to come in every 12 weeks for their injections. Then finally, just I'll close with this, is that there's a, still a ton of research going on for new drugs, new pathways. There's so much molecular biology of the retina underway, so it's an exciting time. Many of these have already failed, others are being developed, but there's a lot of new stuff happening all the time, and we participate in a lot of trials here for new compounds here all the time. So in conclusion, again, there are new treatments for macular, new treatments for macular degeneration. We, we have three heroes of the story, Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea. All are spectacular. You can quibble about one versus the other, but all do a great job. And we've been able to use them now for a number of years very safely, and we're quite comfortable with them. We have three new ones of the new generation, and they are both all also anti-VEGF compounds, but they're just longer duration. That's where we are now. We're happy with that. None of them are available yet. Hopefully they'll stop becoming available over the next year. But again, there's new class of drugs that are also being developed. And the big barrier still is dry macro generation. There is nothing for it. There's work being done. But as of yet, nothing yet is available. So that is our big challenge because as we've handled the problems from wet macro generation, dry macro generation begins to be more and more of a problem. Thank you very much. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit. Um, Mary talked a lot about things we can do in office to help prevent what this treatment is meant for. So, you know, the thing I'm going to talk about is meant for end stage patients. This is not something that is um, really mainstream for most macular degeneration patients, but uh, it is a, a unique device that uh, had some of its beginnings here at the, at the Gavin Herbert Institute. I think. Uh, Barry was involved in, in some of the early trials, and I know Becky Cameron was also involved in that as well. Uh, and I've been involved with the technology for a couple of years, and you know, for the right patient, it really can have profound uh, benefits. So again, back to the eye, working like a camera, the retina being the film. If the retina cannot be revived with some of the treatments that Dr. Cooperman was talking about, oftentimes it leads to scarring. And when you get that scarring, you end up with what's called a scotoma. And a scotoma is a blind spot in your vision. So imagine if you took a picture and you took a picture of someone's face not being able to see their face. No matter how you looked, you couldn't see their face unless you sort of looked off to the side and then you can get a, a, an inkling of what's going on in their face. So this technology 
uh, takes a very complex telescope and shrinks it down into something that we can put into the eye. And we do this um, traditionally at the time of cataract surgery. So we take out your cataract and we put in this lens. And there's been some recent uh, changes with how we approach this that now we can take out your existing cataract lens, your artificial lens, your intraocular lens, and replace it with this device uh, if, if certain criteria are met. So back to the scarred macula, you have the center. So just say the word cat is there and you can't see part of the C, the A, and part of the T. Well, what this does is it magnifies the image onto your retina so that now maybe just part of that A you can't see. So you're, you're gaining perspective on everything because everything gets blown up. Um, there are external uh, telescopes that can be mounted on people's glasses uh, that provide a similar type of experience. But the difference is with when it's in your eye, when you move your eyes to the left or right, it moves with you. Whereas if you have something on your glasses, you have to move your whole head in order to, to be able to see what you're looking at. So there is there is that advantage. Uh, it also gives you a pretty wide, a wider field of view than the, than the typical mounted uh, external telescope. Um, about you know three times the implanted view or 625% of the image, so quite a bit more image you get with perspective. So one of the things you get with these telescopes is you get a shrinking of your peripheral vision. So if we can expand that in any way with, with this telescope, <coughs> because this only goes in one eye, and then in your fellow eye, you use that for your peripheral vision, because one of the, one of the um, sort of screening things for this um, technology is it goes into uh, patients who have bilateral loss of vision. Bilateral meaning mm -hmm. both eyes, central loss of vision. So it's not meant for everyone. So if you have good vision in one eye and really bad vision in the other eye for macular degeneration, unfortunately, this technology won't help. And there's a good reason for that. If you put it into the eye that was and that has that macular degeneration, but your other eye is still good, you'll pretty much ignore what's going on in the eye with the telescope because just with the way the brain works, it'll, it'll always go towards uh, the easier, easier pathway for vision. Uh, this technology requires a team. Uh, in order to be successful. You know, the most important person in the team is the patient. Uh, but then we have our retina specialists, and we have our low vision colleagues, and then um, the implanting surgeon. So what does the telescope do? Well, it provides magnification, so you're able to see smaller details without, um, that weren't visible without magnification before. It minimizes that scotoma, so it takes that area that you can't see and makes it smaller, thereby sort of improving your vision. If you look at you know, our, our formal ways of, of measuring vision, you do get uh, a visual uh, improvement um, of a couple lines of vision, which is um, significant. And then I think one of the, the bigger um, benefits is that it permits natural scanning. Uh, and then it allows vision improvement um, for, so I think, more day-to-day -day stuff. Like, you know, if you actually look at some of my happiest patients with this, their vision didn't improve significantly when we, when we measure them in clinic but their quality of vision and their quality of life improved significantly. So with this telescope in the eye, you, uh, you use this in the eye that has you know, profound vision loss. So in the eye that, that happens, you regain some central vision, and then you use your fellow eye for peripheral vision and ambulation, so that way you don't trip and fall, uh, because this will give you a constricted field of view in that eye. So uh, key criteria for patients, uh, you have to have bilateral geographic atrophy, which is the dry type of macular degeneration, or the end stage of, of a wet macular degeneration, which can result in a scar. You have to be over 65 years or old uh, with evidence of a cataract. Um, so having a cataract at least one eye, that was the classic uh, sort of key criteria. Vision has to be pretty bad, 2160 or worse. Um, just for context, legally blind is 2200 or worse. Uh, Pre-op improvement on the eye chart using an external telescope, and I think Dr. Cameron's gonna demonstrate that. Uh, you can't. You have to have otherwise like pretty healthy eyes. So if you have glaucoma, you can't do it. Uh, if you have any active uh, macular degeneration, uh, you're not a candidate for this technology. So if you're getting injections from the retina service, um, this is not the technology for you. If you've had a retinal detachment or anything that might affect your peripheral vision, again, uh, not the best technology for you. And if you've had any previous intraocular corneal surgery, this was true as of September of 2017, where the FDA has given us uh, the ability to pursue a trial where we can take out uh, suitable candidates who have macular degeneration bilateral but have had cataract surgery. 
we can now go in and take out their existing lens and put this lens in in its place. Uh, so for these patients, you know, what we're looking at to see is, is this feasible? We know it is. Uh, it's been done plenty of times now that we know that we can do it. The question is, does it help patients as much as we think that it will? And, and that's what we're trying to explore right now. Admittedly, the, the uh, trial has been a little slow to, um, to enroll, uh, but I think a lot of it is, you know, people don't know that this technology is out there. Uh, it's a small company, they don't have the marketing budget to really get the word out there. Uh, but we do have patients who come in from time to time who, who are candidates for the procedure um, and uh, you know, we're, we're trying to actively enroll these patients uh, for, for trial. So when you look at the, at the telescope, you know, one of the key outcome measures uh, is really this threshold of 2200 that I mentioned. So you know, patients who are, are worse than that you know, are, are legally blind, centrally blind. And with the telescope, we find that they sort of leapfrog that 2200 and get to a point where their, their average vision is, is not great and you're not gonna be driving a car, but you can you know, enjoy TV, you can take care of yourself. And that's one of the things we see in a lot of patients who have macular degeneration, they become dependent on other people. And if, you can, if we can benefit them and we can make them more independent, that, that gives them a lot more self-esteem. Um, they're able to enjoy life. You know, I had a patient who, I think my first patient who I implanted with a telescope was a gentleman who, who really loved the angels. And the angels suck. And um, he, he still loved them and he couldn't watch them. And once we put the telescope in, his vision actually didn't improve when we looked at it uh, from a numerical standpoint, but he was able to watch TV follow the games, and he was just a happy guy uh, for the remainder of his time. So uh, really um, a, a unique device, but in the right patient, very, very powerful. So in conclusion, uh, the implantable mini telescope can be very effective for the right patient. It does require a team approach, which we have here at the Gavin Urban Institute, uh, but can have a profound impact on these patients with end-stage AMD. Thank you. So what is low vision rehabilitation? Well, the lighting is a really important uh, piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, first thing that patients we, we talk about is, especially with macular degeneration, is how low lighting is makes things very difficult. It's difficult to read, to see small print, to see even faces in a dim room. And it can even impact um, risk of falls, not seeing when there's elevations in the room or going from carpet to the solid surface. So lighting is a really important thing, even for early macular degeneration, maybe you don't have it affected in, in both eyes and, and you're not having difficulty with seeing small print, but lighting is probably the number one thing where when it's a dim room, things shut down quite a bit. Well, low vision rehabilitation is when you have two, two eyes that are affected by a disease. So if it's macular degeneration, both eyes have it and are causing some kind of impairment in both eyes. Then you would see me or someone like me who provides this kind of service. And our goal is to see what kind of vision you have, find the best areas of your vision, and then work to maximize it or enhance it. All of that so that you can enjoy life to a greater degree. And that might be so that you can read small print again. For some people, it may be leisure activities like watching TV or going to the angel game. Um, but it's, it's daily life. So when someone sits down in my chair, we just talk about what do you do during your day and what are you limited by? And sometimes they'll say, well, I just want to see better in general. But my goal is actually to get us to identify some very specific things that we can work on. Because there isn't one thing, one device, one magnifier that can do everything for everybody. I would say if there was one, the closest thing would be the implantable telescope. Because it does go in one eye. And then we do have to learn how to navigate with, with uh, the fellow eye, as uh, Dr. Gar was talking about. It's a lot of getting used to how you use one eye for one thing and, and the other for, the, for, for other uh, purposes. But that device, then we can build on it. We can add other magnifiers even on the outside of that eye once it's implanted in the eye. But generally speaking, we kind of call it a toolkit. There's going to be different devices for different types of tasks. And that's because of optics and how we make things bigger and how we help someone to be able to use their vision. It varies, A, be person to person, but it also varies based on the tasks that you want to do. So let me explain a little bit more about macular degeneration and how it impacts uh, daily function. So as Dr. Cooperman was talking about the retina, a very good description of the room, and I'll probably steal that in my explanations to patients about the anatomy of the eye and the retina and so on. It does just affect the macula. The good news is, is that you never go totally blind. And that is a question that people don't always ask. Maybe we assume it as a doctor. 
but it does not impact that peripheral retina, which means that you still have peripheral vision, good peripheral vision. And that means that we can navigate and walk around. Um, there's still some issue, again, with being able to see elevations, and so the risk of falls with macular degeneration does go up. But peripheral vision overall, in simplest form, is, is fairly good. So it's never going to be a dark uh, night, day you know, situation. So that's, that's really important to remember. With it affecting both eyes, though, it typically causes these blind spots, or scotomas, as Dr. Garg was talking about. So if you have blind spots in both eyes and your central vision, you're trying to look at somebody, the blind spot moves with your eyes, very maddening. So if you're trying to look at somebody's face, it just disappears, the features disappear. Well, the amazing thing about our brain is that it usually picks the better eye to work with and, and maybe ignores the other eye or suppresses the other eye. So if we take the better eye and the brain automatically starts to learn how to use that eye, it learns how to push the scotoma or blind spot out of the way a little bit to learn how to use a new peripheral area to, to look. So if you are looking at somebody and they have macular degeneration and they're looking at you, they may actually look to the side of you or above you. Or if you have macular degeneration, you may have a better spot where you look or view in order to see better. Amazingly, most people don't actually, they're not aware of that spot. They're not aware that they're looking in a certain direction. Some of my engineer patients are. They say, if I look two inches to the right of your face, I can see your eyes better. <laughs> Fantastic, good. But most people are not aware. There's a little study, about 80% of patients weren't aware of where their blind spot was. So that's the first thing we're going to do in evaluation is understand where the blind spots are, which eye is taking over and becoming that better eye. Sometimes, though, the dominant eye, let's say you shot guns or you always did something with your, your right eye, and that was your dominant eye, and you know that's your dominant eye, if that becomes your worst eye, then you might have some problems with rivalry, where the two eyes are kind of fighting in terms of that blind spot, kind of overlapping the other one. So even if you have a better eye, the dominant worst eye can be taking over. So we have to establish that. Is the better eye really doing its work, or is the bad eye kind of jumping in and taking over? And then we work on strategies of covering that eye when you're trying to read, and we wouldn't wear an eye patch all the time, but just specific strategic things. So we'd evaluate that blind spot. We'd also look at what's called contrast sensitivity. And that has to do with that lighting. So when contrast is suppressed, which is true most often in macular degeneration, and even in the aging eye, our ability to see contrast, which is shades of gray, and, and, um, is, is quite suppressed. Macular degeneration, even more so. So that means we need more lighting to try to get see the differences in grays and colors and so on. So we would talk about that and even explore the level of, of contrast sensitivity loss. Because at the end, when we're talking about what are we going to do, of course, lighting is going to be a really important thing. One of the tests I might use is a card like this, a reading card. So I want to understand how reading fluency is with those blind spots, with contrast, etc., with whether you have two eyes or kind of fighting. And so we'll have a high contrast side, and then we'll have a low contrast side. And most people will say they might even read some of that smaller print in the low contrast and actually have pretty good visual acuity, maybe 20, 40 or so, just beginning of macular degeneration in both eyes. And yet when you come to the faded side, they'll say, what, what print are you talking about? Or they'll read way up here on the very top. So this is when we know that it's highly impacted. And for some, it's really severe, and others, not as, not as bad. So we'll have some education talking about how to make things a better contrast at home. When you're having your food on your plate and you have rice or pasta that's very light, maybe use a black plate so that you can see the food pop a little bit more. Very simple strategies that can really change someone's enjoyment of eating or even putting on makeup. One strategy might be putting a black towel behind you as you're looking in the mirror so that your face, if it's a paler face, with a black towel will really pop in terms of contrast. So there's strategies like that that I might talk about. But we'll work with community partners like occupational therapists or independent living skills counselors from some of our community groups, Braille Institute or Dale McIntosh Center, and we'll team up together. I'll do my evaluation and share the information of what's, what's really um, uh, impaired in, in those various areas we talked about, and then we'll work with a therapist or an independent living skills counselor to go in the home and really help that person kind of modify things in the home environment, really work on their lighting again. Then what we'll go into in the exam is magnification. Well, how do we make things bigger? So Sam's picture, Dr. Garg's picture of the telescope where the, the cat was larger, 
that's the idea is if we can get the, the letters and the things that you're looking at larger than the blank spot, then you can kind of figure out what you're looking at. It's still a slow process to read that way though. So it's never gonna be amazingly fast reading like it was 20 years before, but maybe we can get it to a functional level where it's still enjoyable for some people. And if it's too slow, then maybe we go into audiobooks or we use um, Alexa and those kind of strategies to kind of replace some of the reading that we might have done. But the magnific magnification is a really big strategy. So we can do that with optical devices and we can also do it with um, video magnification technology. So this is an example of those telescopes that might be on the outside the eye on the glasses. So people can actually drive with these. Not everybody can drive with low vision, but within a certain realm, you could get a uh, restricted license. And so we talk about driving if that's something that's, that's important. Um, and these would be something where you would be driving, let's say, or walking because it's not in my way of the ground. But then I would tip my head down in order to see faces. And maybe you can see even my eyes are a little larger as we look through there. My view of you as the user is larger as well. So I can see two times closer or two times larger. So I'll pass these around a little bit and if they work without your glasses, because they are custom and they do have to have your glasses prescription in there and so on, so you can get an idea. And then I'll collect those things at the end. That's magnification for distance. So the telescope that goes in the eye, imagine that little thing inside the eye. Well, it has to be very small and it is. It's like the tip of your tiniest pinky fingernail. But we take a look through this telescope when we're evaluating a patient for that implant to see if they respond well. To see if their scotoma is, it, it's going to be large, but can we look around it and can we benefit from just an external telescope? I joke that we're going to try to put this in your eye surgically, but that would not really be very good or comfortable. But it's a simulator, so you can take a look across the room, just close your other eye so that they don't fight or have rivalry. And then you can see that this is about three times magnification. So we can do magnification in the eye or we can do it on the outside of the glasses. We still have to deal with that blind spot a bit though, of course, and there are strategies for that. And then up close, there's different types of magnification. So we can do hand magnifiers. Now, a lot of people come to me and they say, oh, I, already ha I have a magnifier. I got it from my mom or my neighbor or the store. That's great, but those magnifiers are usually about 1.5x to 2x, they just magnify a little bit. So it might be good in an early stage, it might be a boost, it's fine, it's not going to hurt you if the magnification from a hand magnifier is incorrect. But there are more strategic ways to go about it and to, to prescribe magnifiers that are the appropriate power for that person's level of vision loss. So that's going to be part of the evaluation as well. So it's not really show and tell, it's an evaluation where we establish how much magnification do you need, what type of magnification is going to be best and most useful with your blind spots and contrast and so on. And let's say you have arthritis or, or tremors. This might not be the best device. But there are other devices that rest on the page and really help you with that unsteadiness. So there's other alternatives for that. So these type of magnifiers, again, are they're going to be a little higher than you can get over the counter. So they're more prescribed type of magnifiers. Pass up. The other thing that I like to do is make sure they have a good light in there. Because again, remember I talked about lighting and contrast. So some of those over-the-counter ones do not have a very good light at all. They're very cheap for a reason, and that's okay. But a light is really important. So take a look at those. So this is a type of near magnification. Everybody asks, though, are there some glasses that can just do it all for me? And I have to tell you, there's no magic glasses. There's no magic glasses that if you just make them stronger, it's going to take care of everything. But we can adjust near reading glasses by making those stronger. The drawback, though, of stronger reading glasses is that you have to hold things closer, which means that it's a pretty close distance. Some patients, as I'm showing them these stronger glasses, their head's going further and further back, and I'm trying to say, no, we've got to bring it a little closer. So it's, it's a compromise. It's not going to be just making them the same, and they'll say, I want to hold it here. Well, you can't. So with stronger glasses, with more magnification, you know, they've got to hold it closer. So we'll explore that option. We'll explore whether it's just going to be for one eye or both eyes and, and some factors that go into that. Sometimes an over-the-counter stronger pair, this is a plus four. So if you know your readers, you get plus 2.5s, plus 3.0s, maybe. 
you can't really go beyond that. But there are ones that we can do that are fairly inexpensive that are a plus 4.0. That might be good for some early macular degeneration. Yes. And you have to hold things a little bit closer. You can't get these at CVS, but you can get them through our optical. We'll order them for you. Of course, you'd have to go through the evaluation. You can't just pick them up either. But it is a strategy that might work for some people who don't need a custom prescription. They've already had cataract surgery, that type of thing. Then there are filters that we might explore, which help us with glare management. So the problem is, is although you might have difficulty with not enough light, so we need more light, the wrong kind of light coming into your eye in a certain direction causes glare. And that's a big problem for macular degeneration. So you don't like the wrong kind of light, but you need the right kind of light. So managing that is what we're going to work with both our community partners who go into the home to help you with that, and also in our evaluation when we talk about that and explore. Sometimes we might do a filter that helps just to cut some of the glare at certain times. Maybe it's a clip-on that flips up out of the way. Maybe it's the big goggle type ones or some that are not as ugly as others. So we do try to make them as pretty as we can in terms of the types of sunglasses or fit-overs that we might use. In some conditions, we might actually use a plum color um, clip-on. So certain diseases, there might be a, a, a certain preference for a certain color that helps with some of the glare. These are some newer ones that have come out. They're not there. We always talk about blue blockers. So yellow can cut some of that um, light scatter and maybe indirectly improve contrast. These are toted for night driving just to cut a little bit of glare. It's really subjective, meaning you've got to try it and see if it's great or not. It, I think they're incremental. Incremental helps. So sometimes we'll lend them out and let someone try it if they are driving. But there are some fun colors and tints and things that can be done. So, all in all, vision rehabilitation is about enhancing the vision that you have, but we have to establish what that vision is. And it goes a little bit beyond looking at the anatomy of the retina and the different parts of the eye. It's looking at vision function, how your blind spots are affecting you, how your both eyes working together are affecting you, how contrast loss is affecting you, and then what you do during the day. For some people, it's really important for them to read, and for others, it's not important at all. So we really want to pick the things that are most important find the right tools and connections to be able to help people do that. And really connect with our community partners to make sure that whatever we recommend goes and changes lifestyles with you. So it's not just a pair of glasses that I do or don't use, it's really incorporated into lifestyles so that it's a new way of doing things. And that's about all I have. So. Yes. I also realized that we didn't have as part of the handout to a couple of things before we go to questions. I give this to all of my patients. So I'm having uh, Dana, and I want to thank Dana Collinson for organizing this uh, community-based uh, series. Well, the instructions I give to my patients, macular generation worksheet, it lists our doctors and our phone numbers. But I talked about zinc from the A-RED study as the first bullet point. The second bullet point, I mentioned lutein and the need for dark leafy green vegetables. The third bullet point is fish and eating it a couple times a week. The fourth one is something I did not mention earlier, but it occurred to me when you mentioned the plum color glasses. Sunlight is white light made up of all the colors of the rainbow. But the blue component of sunlight has been shown in a study to be particularly toxic to the macula and increases the risk of macular generation. Now there's, so there is a way to filter out blue light preferentially, and that's to wear brown tinted sunglasses. So we recommend brown tinted sunglasses, but I do want to say that everything else on this sheet of paper has clinical trials that have proven the benefit. The sunglasses have not been shown. That is, we know that blue light is toxic, but we've never shown that by filtering out blue light with brown sunglasses, that it, does, it minimizes the risk, but we infer that it's true based on the data. And then for the final bullet, two bullet points are taking a regular multivitamin, and the final one is the Multivitamins were developed by the A-RED study, the age-related eye disease study. And the reason I recommend Bausch & Lohm products is not because I make any money from Bausch & Lohm, but those were the ones that were studied in the clinical trial. The other ones are probably equivalent. What I do say is in the realm of nutraceuticals, I do not recommend generics. In real life, I take generics like everybody else, they save some money. But the nutraceutical, the vitamin industry is so poorly regulated that any company can say, that they've got anything in it and it may or may not be in there. So go with the name brands in that case because they've got a reputation to uphold. If there was an expose showing that they did not have what they say that they would suffer a huge stock market loss, so that's what protects us. So that's why I recommend Bausch & Lohm, but also Alcon makes the products and others as well, but the ones that were studied with Bausch & Lohm. So that's in my handout there. 
The other thing I want to say briefly before we go on to the questions is I want to introduce Mary Pruden. She is um, here. At, we have uh, not only do a lot of research, clinical trial, basic science, but we have patient support groups. And she leads two organizations, the National Keratoconus Foundation, but also the Mac of the Generation Partnership. And there is a handout out there from the Mac of the Generation Partnership. And as part of that, her and Jay, are you here? Jay was here, but not there, not here now. They help organize uh, support groups, there's Jay, uh, support groups and uh, chat groups, discussion groups. I see one of the members of them here. And um, and again, there's a handout about that, and we try to have, uh, also I think, can you just get up and just talk about what Andrew Brown's been doing, one of our faculty, he's been doing extra stuff. Sure, so if you go to the Facebook, uh, Macular Generation Partnership has a, has a pretty active page we post every week. We also take short videos of some of the doctors, so some of these doctors here you'll recognize. And they usually ask answer a question that someone has emailed into us. So it's a sort of a quick way of getting a quick consult. So that's sort of fun. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out every other month, and and that's we'd love to share that with you. That's a, it's sent electronically, so you need an email address, but you can leave your email, and we will go ahead and enroll you. And if you like to read it, great. If not, you can always unsubscribe. But there's no there's no downside to getting some more information. We usually talk about. Um, some some active clinical trials. People are always interested in what's what's new, what kind of research is going on, and uh, and then also some sort of tips for daily living. Uh, we'll have something on sunglasses, or we'll have something on vitamins, or how to you know depression is something we need to talk about tonight. Yeah, it's, a, right. it's a it's a there's a, a big correlation, and so it's always sort of important to sort of talk to your doctor about that and do what you can to sort of not get too too down about about your situation and to do what you can. I think some of the services of getting med regular medical treatments, getting low vision rehabilitation are ways you could sort of combat some of the sort of the, the, the blues that you might get that, that uh, sometimes affect. But um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for the department who cares about your medical uh, wellness to also sort of care about that your quality of life is as good as it can be. So it's a, it's a unique uh, program that we've got here. and. We're happy to uh, happy to be in the community. It's a good question. You, there's no pain. There are nerve endings in the retina, but they're not particularly there in that part of the retina, nor do they ever cause pain. What you notice, if anything, is a loss of vision. But there's a lot of reasons that you would lose vision, so that's why you need to have regular eye exams. Yeah. So again, it's part of the process of certainly over the age of 60, annual eye checks would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Optometrists, whether it's an opt optometrist or an ophthalmologist, they're trained to look in the <laughs> eye. Ophthalmologists more so optometry, but many there's many competent optometrists in there as well. What optometrists do, quite honestly, that ophthalmologists don't do, I think it's because their training is a little different and candidly not quite as sophisticated with the exception of a super sophisticated <laughs> optometrist like Becky, is that they take a lot of pictures. We can look in there and see stuff, but they take pictures, perhaps more than the ophthalmologist would, but when they see it on the picture, then they can see those little white spots. They say, aha, those are drusen, and then those should refer you to somebody. Okay. So it's usually, a, if, if properly managed, it's a diagnosis that's made before it's visually significant. But over time, there is a degradation of vision. The trouble is that there's other many things that can cause degradation of vision. So anything that you have concerns about vision, going to see whether it's an optometrist, but preferentially an ophthalmologist, et cetera, in the community or here, uh, just to make sure that you're getting care. The one thing that development from dry to wet that is the hallmark of that is that straight lines become wobbly as the retina becomes moist and damp from the leaking. The photoreceptors don't line up so much. So if you get distorted vision, so I tell people with dry, I ask them to, you know, look at, you know, just door frames, whatever, if it looks, if the 90 degree angle of that door frame looks wobbly, that's a reason to come in. But that's usually development of a late disease. So those with macular degeneration, that is actually on the sheet of paper too. I forgot to mention that, that was, I wasn't looking at it, but the AMS are great. I do recommend up to a point. I find the AMS a little tedious, but a lot of people put it on the refrigerator, close one eye at a time, make, you gotta have your readers on. But I find just regular, I encourage them to as they're approaching the refrigerator, instead of looking at the arms are good, just close one at a time and see if the refrigerator still looks like a rectangle. <laughs> right? That's just as good. You're looking for a straight line, lines gone awry. So there's other ways to check yourself without. The trouble with Amsler is you need to have a magnifier on to really see the detail of the, uh, of the lines, but I do recommend that. And I don't really recommend daily. That seems overkill, but like weekly for those that already have 
established dry macro generation. Now, to add to that, if your vision fluctuates minute to minute, you know, when you're reading, that's not macular degeneration. That's a very good point. But that, that's more likely ocular surface disease, dry eye. This is whatever uh, Dr. Cooperman's talking about here is more persistent. It's not going to change. If you blink, you can't get rid of that irregularity. But if you have dry eye, you blink, 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 that might get better. So uh, you have to sort of distinguish the two. And that's a very good point. And also, I just want to emphasize <laughs> the trouble with the word dry is there's two huge diseases of the eye that have nothing to do with each other that both use the word dry. Dry eye, which is what Sam just mentioned, which is tearing or lack of tearing. And ironically, dry eyes lead to wet eyes because you have such, your eyes are so dry that you develop reactive tearing. So it's actually, would tell your eyes are dry when tears are pouring out of you and you're thinking we're crazy. That's the front surface of the eye. Then there's the dry macular generation, which is on the inside back line of the eye, which of course the eye is only that big, but in our world it's this big. And so that's the front surface dry eyes tearing, back inside surface dry macular generation, nothing to do with each other. No, there's no evidence. It's a very good question. I get asked that a lot. So as the dry is progressing, and sometimes people can lose vision from dry. First you get, you know, the little areas of defects that begin to look like you're looking through a screen door. It's not as crisp as it used to be. And sometimes there can be actually zones of scotomas, as Sam mentioned, where there's loss of vision there. But there's no evidence that injecting uh, anti-VEGF into an eye with dry will make it better. In fact, there's, op there's the opposite concern. We've observed that eyes that are getting a lot of injections, eyes with wet macular generation that get the regular injections, it seems to promote and accelerate the development of dry macular generation. Now that would take a lot of injections to get there, but that's why we really don't advocate the use of injections for dry macular generation at all. Not only can it not help, but it may actually hurt. You know, I mean, if you're talking about LED lighting in a, in a room and so on, it tends to be a little bit brighter and, can, and you know, it has all the colors of the wavelength and there are these newer uh, LEDs that are even more efficient and, and so on, better so than, than fluorescents. Mm -hmm. Fluorescents have a lot of short wavelength blue light that can be kind of bothersome, a lot of light scatter in the aging eye. Um, when you're talking about LEDs in a, in a closer lamp and so on, we haven't found any real damage. I mean, I'm not really talking about the blue short wavelength too much, but if they're efficient, it seems like that's the way everything's going anyway. Um, but I think it's, they produce a nice bright output. This is just a little flashlight that I recommend to some of my patients. It's like 12 bucks at Home Depot. It's called Little Larry, L-I-L-L-A-R-R-Y, and you can keep in your purse even if you don't have macular degeneration. It is so, it's little LEDs. But it's very bright. So I use them, yes. I As a general rule of thumb, we think, though there's been some studies that are mixed, that none of the handheld iPads, iPhones, computer screens, etc., are really generating enough light to harm us. Sunlight, yes. And again, the study, the blue light toxicity study, was done in the 70s and 80s out of uh, Johns Hopkins. It was called the Chesapeake Bay Waterman Study. <coughs> So where the evidence of the blue light toxicity was, and again it was watermen because there were very few water women back in the day, I suspect there are some now, but these are people and it showed that a 20 year, so when sunlight hits the ocean, or any light, uh, any water, snow, river, ocean, it creates little rainbows and the red component of the rainbow dives down deep into the water and the blue component bounces back into our eyes. So it took a 20 year history of daily exposure as a boater, as a waterman, on the Chesapeake Bay to develop this increased risk of macular generation. So it was a really an extended exposure. Now that being so, again, the biggest source of light we all have is the sun. So again, I routinely wear blue tinted sunglasses, I mean brown tinted sunglasses when I'm outside because why not? In fact, some, many ball players like it. They think they can see the spin on the ball a little better. Golfers like it, you can see sometimes better contrast. So, and the second best, if you don't like the brown, is to get just the neutral filter, the gray. They're the, they, they reduce all the light equally. The brown does the blue more specifically, but those are the two best colors to choose. Anything else you should not use. And polarized? Polarized, you can get brown that's polarized as well. And should you, should you aim? Yeah, polarized is preferred as well, if you can. But again, and also I just mentioned, it should be brown. The orange can be kind of weird, and some orange colors, you can't see the green stoplight. 
So that's bad. So, and then some people choose on a cloudy day to have yellow tinted lenses. Same thing when you're skiing. Skiers, on a cloudy day, it's the yellow tinted lens. It gives you the contrast, but blocks out blue. Or, uh, um, but then brown. I would skip the orange, which some people end up with, and I think oh, that's not very good. It's not very sightly, and it changes color too much, and it may actually create some deficit. So either yellow for cloudy days, brown, or then the gray is a bad thing. Totally different disease state, but we're glad to talk about it. There's two different types of occlusion. The most common one, well, there's two different categories of occlusion, venous occlusions and arterial occlusions. Venous is much more common than arterial. Arterial occlusions, and each one of those have two subtypes, central and branch. So central retinal artery occlusion and branch retinal artery occlusion. Much more common, central retinal vein occlusion, the most common of all, branch retinal vein occlusion. So it depends on if, the, every, if those pictures of the blood vessels in the eye, any tissue in the body, the artery, arteries or arterials bring blood full of oxygen to the tissue, and then the venous side takes the dispense, the blood that's already had the oxygen to consume back to the heart, or the lungs to the heart, etc. cetera. So um, the venous side is the one that's most common for a vein occlusion, and that is actually treated, what happens with the vein occlusion, there can be swelling in the retina. You don't get macular degeneration, you get macular edema, swelling edema of the macula. And what do we treat it with? <coughs> the exact same drugs that I showed you, Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea. There's actually a steroid you can also use, but that's the least common use that people would typically use that. So then if it was an arterial occlusion, then that is a, a true stroke, and that really needs a full body workup, a cardiologist, neurologist. And if it happens acutely, there is a window of 90 minutes to do something about it. Otherwise, it tends not to be reversible like many strokes or not. So those are two very different categories. The arterial occlusions, particularly central retinal artery occlusion, is quite devastating. The venous occlusions have therapy, though they can still have associated with anywhere from a great outcome to a bad outcome. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned, so photodynamic therapy is something that we used before we had these drugs. Yeah. It was good, but not great. Photodynamic therapy, what that is, is a field, is that you get a dye injection into the vein of your arm, different than the dye we get. Some of the, pic some of the pictures we, I showed you those black and white pictures, showed an area of leafage, that was from dye injecting the vein in the arm. This is a separate dye that is a photoactive agent, and it responds to a specific wavelength. So you inject it into the vein in your arm, you wait about 10 minutes, and then you shine it with a laser, uh, with a lens, you shine a cold laser, not much power, but a specific wavelength that causes a chemical reaction in the leaking tissue to shut those vessels down. And the reason that was good but not great is that in the natural history of wet macular generation, vision went this way. With photodynamic, meaning it got worse. With photodynamic therapy, it got worse but not as worse, not as bad. And once we've had the injections, things started actually getting better than they were at baseline. So we've abandoned photodynamic therapy with some exceptions. We still have that machine downstairs and we use it from time to time because sometimes some eyes need so many injections that we feel like we're lost and we just, we're just we falling behind. So we combine it together with the injections. So it still exists, mm -hmm. but for before 2000, that seminal year of 2005, 2006, for the five to 10 years before that, that was the mainstay of therapy. Thank you. Good question. So is this about that rivalry issue when the more dominant eye becomes the worse eye? You can't do anything to train the disease away. So the disease status is what it is. Um, but in terms of trying to train your brain to use the, the less dominant eye as a better eye, yes, that's possible. And we do it actually even with the implantable telescope as we train each other. But it requires some time with a rehabilitation team, myself, and then an occupational therapist who's experienced in that. And there's not that many teams, but we do have one here in Southern California. And we really just work on uh, kind of patching and, and paying attention to that and working on activities with that better eye and so on. We'll say the last question for past data. But, so we always have ongoing clinical trials here. They, they come and go. Right now we've got uh, dry macular degeneration, wet macular degeneration, retinal vein occlusion trials, um, and then on the cornea side, there's I trials. I all trials, we have a lens trial. Uh, so there's usually stuff going on, but uh, I'm not sure how good we are making sure that we're posting everything on our websites. But as a, as a general rule, 
in almost every area we have trials going. And beyond that, we actually have um, a lot of innovation happening that generates here. We've got uh, some very good scientists here. We actually have a very large clinical group, but also a pretty large scientific group. A lot of products have come out of this department. So we have trials of things that are, we're now gonna be starting of stuff that was developed here. We've got some stem cells that were created here that we're using to treat retinitis pigmentosa, a totally different disease. But we think those same cells could be used for dry macro generation. So that'll be something that we're gonna be looking at. So there is, basically that's one thing that universities tend to do in our department is very robust. We've actually had something like seven companies that have been founded out of our technology that were developed here here at this department. So yes, there's ongoing, at any given time, uh, clinical trials and also we can let you know. And I think the most efficient way is become a patient for the department and then the doctors, yeah. they're, they're always looking for those particular studies. True that. And so they'll funnel you based on what your criteria is. So. There's that option too. Well, thank you everyone for your attention on attendance on our rainy night.